Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Traveling Molly's reading series. Here we are once again. Um, and tonight we've got people from all over the continent uh, joining us. Um, Nina, are you are you there? Here we are. Okay, yeah, we've got people here from Florida, Hawaii, Canada, Mexico, and who am I missing? Maine, Vermont, um, California. Yeah. Is there anyone from Chicago? Other? No, I know there are. <laughs> <laughs> The my, we're in the minority, but we're here. We've got poetry. Um, we have usually we have great open mics, but our features tonight are Cyrus Cassells and Virginia Conchin, who um, I haven't seen live for a long time. So we're going to be doing virtual hugs, which is today we fist bump with some new people. So. We're still doing that. Um, so, so welcome. We usually start tonight with, um, or our Molly's nights with um, poems from your hosts. Tonight, um, you're only gonna hear a poem from Al because the poems didn't make it all the way down to Mexico for me. Uh, so Al, let's hear what you got. Okay. The. Uh... There's a train going by in the background, so that'll just add some ambiance to this poem. Um, for those of you who uh, know, don't know, I, I publish a magazine called After Hours, and the new issue is in my hands. It'll be getting mail to, uh, to uh, those people who subscribe and contribute. Um, but I'm gonna read a poem from, from the new After Hours. It's, it's called Stigmata. I do not go to church anymore, but today my friend, the Franciscan friar is saying mass in a century old chapel built by old world craftsmen. I've come for the architecture, the Gothic echoes, the stained glass stories. My friend is celebrating the stigmata of St. Francis. His homily speaks of how we mark our private treasures as well as our books with initials and notes, how Christ marked Francis how our bodies are marked with scars, how our souls are scarred with the panhandlers we've left begging on windy winter street corners. The poet priest fills the air with metaphor. I see my soul, weakness and desire tattooed across its shoulders. I look at my hands covered with the scars of holding too tight. I hide my unholy stigmata under a coat of regret, ragged at the cuffs. And I ask with an awkward prayer to be allowed to write one more love poem before I am judged. That's that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. I love so, that. Um, so Nina's not going to read tonight. So we will uh, start our open mic. And um, I'm looking at the faces here and I haven't. I, I haven't heard my old friend Charlie Rossiter read in a while. So Charlie, step up to the plate. I'm making a big experiment here and reading off the screen. Oh, watch out. Okay, I've got a few poems here and I'll be starting with a confessional poem. Um, I was at this reading and this poet said some things um, and you can guess what she said. My pussy is always wet. The poet declares at the outset of a long meandering poem. Naturally curious, I lean in. She has a butterfly or perhaps a spider tattooed on her shoulder and her faded jeans are ripped in complicated places. She has a good tan for early October and is at ease revealing herself as the poem unfolds. It's a strange poem, mysterious and metaphysical, about an experience involving her mother, a train station, and fear of flying. This one uh, has some bunch of Chicago. Actually, this was in the after hours, and I've, I kind of like it. The diner never closed. 
Nothing like empty streets, moonlight on wet asphalt, red light at midnight, no one else around. Waiting for the Block Island Ferry, seagulls in the air, on the pier. Coming into Ocean City, that salty seaside smell. How close did I come? What were their names? Vinegar, those French fries, and past the saltwater taffy. In the photo under streetlights, her hair was black and shining. The diner at North and Western, ever closed, not even for Christmas. Coming back east, this is close by. Feeling privileged, cruising down scenic 7A. Sun shining in the clear blue sky over green mountains. I drift into the depth of satisfaction. Forget the murder rate in Chicago, the gangs of LA, the mess in the Middle East, AIDS, even the drug problems buried in small town New England out there in these lush forests. It's a pure pleasure to enjoy such feelings of comfort and exhilaration after a day at the lake. And it's sad what the human race does to itself. So much pain is part of being human. Buddha was right, and so much of it avoidable. I tried to do my part, live well, do no harm, or at least as little harm as possible. Look, there's a roadside stand, fresh baked corn, tomatoes, cucumbers, goat milk cheddar. It's a good life after all, for those who can afford it. And finally, a little experience uh, up on the Bennington College campus. The music building is in a big old mansion kind of building. And in front of it is just a panoramic view of valleys and mountains. And it's very Vermontish. And this was when classes were closed. It was summertime. Listening to music outside the music building. Two pianos are being tuned at the same time this quiet summer afternoon. The tuner on the left is working lower on the keyboard than the tuner on the right, who sounds as if he might be working in an upper floor. Their rhythms are almost identical as they repeat notes and make adjustments. It sounds surprisingly as if they're playing a duet. That is, if you believe music is organized sound and that the sound matters more than the organization. I can't hear the tree leaves in the wind, but I imagine if I move closer, they sound like a mildly appreciative audience. And then there's a percussive creak on the front door when someone enters or leaves the old stone mansion. It feels as if I'm attending a concert, but it's only the world, human and otherwise, doing its thing. Great stuff, Charlie. Thanks. You, you need to join us more often. <laughs> um, Al, I actually am able to um, access this list. Um, what about um, Richard Nestor? Richard. Can't hear you. Okay. There we go. Okay. Always happy to be invited. Thank you. Uh, two poems. Uh, the first one's called Caves. There was a caddy at my father's club named Jack, a kid just out of middle school. My father called him Rainbow because he'd learned that Jack's granddad had carried a flamethrower at the Battle of Iwo Jima. It's not the sort of thing that you forget. The slow advance of tiny men, Marines, up the side of a seemingly vertical mountain, foreshortened by distance, streaks of flame that looked like rainbows to my dad, each one a promise of return. The promises adding toward the summit, columns of hope that ran from cave to cave, each one of them worth a cheer, if he'd had the time. 
But there was work to do among his shipmates, unloading barrels of explosives down a slick ramp. The ship had run in close enough to shore to take Jap mortar fire, each miss pushing plumes, a spattering of sand. That much he told me, no more. I've accused my dad of being dead to wonder, as if he had a phobia for anything that might amaze or startle. My friend who knows Greek even made up a word, phavmophobia, which translates as fear of the new or strange. It's not the sort of question one asks, what memories of home were in an enemy's mind or on his walls before they turned to ovens. He recalls my son's birthday, August 14, by reference to the day of Japanese surrender, 45 years earlier. Going home was rainbow enough for one life. Uh, the second poem is called For Scythia Again, uh, just because it's the second poem in the book about For Scythia. Uh, in the first poem, I say, For Scythia arises from the mating of kudzu and barbed wire. For Scythia Again. One year the hedge fought back. It was harboring hornets, the way an aircraft carrier harbors jets and I was stung 14 times in as few or as many seconds, depending on how you look at it. I counted them later in the bumpy mists of a Benadryl fog, each one a parable of rage. Now the yard work only seems to keep the house from appearing deserted, though I don't know why it matters. Dad says we get too many visitors anyway. But I'm here. One thing on my mind. If the Forsythia isn't cut back soon, I'll not see our red pickup again. It will rust behind the garage door like a ruby below ground, overcome, overgrown with vines drunk on photosynthetic zeal. Its fuel tank, pregnant with solar heat, burned, compressed, and buried again like a grudge. Nothing spells dispute like territory, and this one is going nowhere, save toward greater weariness. Nothing tears the soul like trying to find a way back that will let you come forward along a different path, yourself but better. It's a fool's equation, what equals what. The world is more full of justice than we know, but it hurts. What's fuel now has been fuel before. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Very nice. Um, let's see, well, we have uh, new to uh, the open mic here is Holly, is it Jaffe? And um, so Holly Jaffe, I'd like to call you up to the mic. Okay. Um, so the first poem is called Pretending. I walked extra hallways to avoid dodging the parade of the attractive and animated. But, but it made me late for class and when I entered the room, my face aflame, I doubted my favorite sweater as I felt 24 sets of eyes consume me and I could feel them collectively spit me out before I reached my seat. Summers, my mother and I pretend, our cozy plot of sand and rocks between two cliffs that jutted out into the algae-filled tides of Lake Erie is our Amalfi Coast. There is no one but us, no one to remind us of who we really are. My mom is in a one-piece yellow ruched bathing suit and her dark hair is gathered beneath a scarf of lattice and gladiolas. I'm in my favorite yellow bikini with the tiny pink daisies. 
I notice my body curves like hers. Our waists are small and our hips full. My mother wishes she had been born an Audrey or a Grace, but she was instead a Sophia, exotic and rounded, living in a town of Sandra's, the rooters, the twirlers, the confections created by America's God or Disney. We never actually say it out loud, but we know we are escapists. When we shut our eyes, we imagine other suns. We have a keen ability to ignore the smell of death, the yellow perch. Most days I'm petrified I too will die of hypoxia. But not this day. Today I have forgotten I'm even breathing or that my heart beats. My mother is leafing through the pages of Vogue and imagines herself a member of Halston's regal entourage. While I'm fixed on a topless David Cassidy who likes the summertime because he can go around the house without a shirt on. I select two pieces of aqua sea glass from the end of my beach towel and place one atop each of my fish eyes. He whispers, I've never seen eyes so green. Um, so I have one more. When Barrett walks into BJ's, heads always turn. He's wearing his signature green Adidas track shorts and a white tank. His blonde hair is forever rumpled. He's tall, narrow, and angular, and he knows. He's well-traveled. He's lived in Amsterdam, London, and San Francisco. He's been in the center of rebellions. He's touched the foot of Jello Bafara. So how did he end up here where the American flag waves so proudly? It's an unusually humid summer and the still air seems carnal. And there's this feeling that we're having our last hurrahs. The Arrhythmics are playing from the DJ's booth and the patrons all look sexy, moving about the bar, leaning in and away, exiting and entering, fluorescent and breathtaking. And as long as the music continues to play, anything seems possible. George Michael comes on and suddenly Barrett lifts me up onto a bar stool and kisses me. And I love the taste of his tongue that's been marinating in whiskey. I'm naive and I don't realize that no matter how honestly I kiss him or if I dab just enough vanilla musk behind each ear, he will always prefer men. And this is a whole other sort of wanting and heartbreak. I wish that we could lose this crowd. Maybe it's better this way. We'd hurt each other with the things we want to say. And when he left us on a Tuesday in late August to find a new scene and new lovers, our tiny town seemed smaller and unbearable. And it was only one year later when I heard that Barrett and a hometown friend, Sam, had died. They died in their 20s like lepers. I can see Sam and Barrett singing Love Shack as they move through the bar, jumping and punching the air. The Love Shack is a little old place where we can get together. Love Shack, baby, Love Shack. Glitter on the mattress, glitter on the highway, glitter on the front porch. So Holly just found us, which is a great opportunity. It's a great excuse to tell people who are watching from um, YouTube that um, if you want to read in the open mic, we choose 10 people from those who let us know. And you can let us know if you know um, Al or my emails or leave us a message on our Facebook uh, messages and join, um, join Traveling Molly's and maybe leave a message there. But just let us know and try to let us know about seven to 10 or days in advance or seven to 14 days. And that's how we found Holly or Holly found us. And if you want to be in the open mic, reach out, reach out to us. Yeah, and, can, uh, I, can I interject just, uh, Nina, if anybody um, wants to get on our mailing list, which um, in addition to uh, Facebook, just um, send your email and a Facebook message if you don't have either of our email addresses and it's Traveling Molly's page on Facebook. So you'll get on the mailing list and then you hopefully won't miss any anything that's going on with this reading series. Okay, Nina. Uh, Pablo, did you have a question or was that a, an applause thing? 
All right, so we don't know, but in the meantime, oh, so did you have, okay, never mind. Okay, Jim Madigan, let's hear what you got. All right, Nina. I've got two poems tonight, and uh, I mean, since uh, Al and Charlie did this, I will too. First one uh, is published in this issue of After Hours. It's called Ilha Domel, Brazil. Within an hour of our arrival, I walked barefoot on a path hacked through growth of small trees, bushes, and ferns. A mostly sand trail near the two rivers with mud and brown water. Attacked by mosquitoes and biting ants, surrounding, surrounded by the sweet smell of rotting vegetation. Mesmerized by the jitterbug of the butterflies and the jazz of the birds, before midday came, I explored tributary trails flowing into the main. My daughters, too, conducted their own search, but in the shade of the late afternoon, I did not stray. Come the twilight of the day, the way grows darker. I continue, open to the shock of the new, a brilliant blossom in bloom just around the next curve of the path. And the second, thank you. The second is a prose poem called My Grandfather's Wake. My father's father died at age 46 in 1946, when my dad was 17 years old. Obviously, I never met him, even as a baby, before memory. But there were stories about him, especially that he was truly a son of the city of big shoulders with tremendous upper body strength, as a result of working in Chicago's main post office, lifting, tossing 100 pound sacks of mail. In the days, the body was the machine. There is a black and white photo of him with a baseball bat after playing 16 inch softball. The bat looking like a matchstick. My father's life exceeded his father's by 34 years. When he was almost 79, the doctors told him he had a year to live and he outsmarted death by two months. I found even after his death, our relationship continued to grow, continued to change. I wanted to know more about my father and began to wonder about my grandfather's influence on him. I asked the only one left to ask, my aunt, my father's youngest sister, to tell me about her father. She closed her eyes and began to describe my father's wake. The family lived on the north side of Chicago, but a group of black postal workers from the south side came to the wake. A line of black men dressed for church, solemnly filed into the funeral parlor as if lining up along third base. Every Irish or Polish face followed them. She knew by their gesture that her father treated black workers with respect and they were returning that respect, risking trouble by traveling to an all white neighborhood to attend his wake. I too grew up in an all white neighborhood. I remember after my sophomore year in high school, my dad got me a summer job where he worked. I was assigned to work on the pick line, putting magazines on a conveyor belt that seemed to speed up as the workers on the line grew tired. On the first day, my father introduced me to the black supervisor and said, pay attention to everything Mr. Harrington tells you. He knows more about running this warehouse than you will ever know. And now I understand what my father learned from his father and what he in turn taught me. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I really enjoyed that last poem. <laughs> Knowing how things work in Chicago, that's, that's a good poem. Um, who's up next? Um, 
let's see. Um, Robbie, Robbie Nestor. Let's hear what you got. Okay. I have two cloud poems. I've read a cloud poem in a frasta cloud poem for you before, and this is uh, two others, but I only have access to one piece of art. The other artist told me I couldn't couldn't use it. So um, this piece uh, is by a photographer named Omid. Uh, it is last name. It's on the poem. Just a minute. by Omid Armin, and it's called Reflection of Woman, but my poem is called Cloud Farming. When trees grew scarce, we turned our faces to the sky, filled with clouds piled high and dark as boulders, rose pink pit postage stamps netting on a blue chapeau, out of necessity, we learn that pressed and supercooled, they turn transparent, glittering like the silver scales on schooling capelin, and could be fashioned into sturdy floors or walls or even roofs. They shimmered like the ice on frozen lakes, powering our world with elemental force. But this abundance had a cost. By borrowing these pieces of the sky, we carved a portal to another universe, hidden within the one we know, as in a puzzle box, a world where everything's reversed, a mirror world. Here our doubles stalk us upside down and backwards, like water gliders, and their reflections on the surface of a pond. Sometimes on hands and knees, we grimace at each other. Try to speak, neither understands, yet we embrace the comforts of proximity. Okay, I'm gonna unshare that. And the other one doesn't have art that I can share because the artist got upset with me and told me I couldn't, <laughs> but, which happens occasionally. Uh, Robbie, who is the artist that you just showed us? Um, Omid Armin. He's um, from Iran and he seems to have disappeared. I, I hope he's still alive and out of prison. Um, because I can't seem to find him anywhere to ask his permission to use the art. But I was told it was in, um, that anyone could use it. He had posted it on a photo site at one point. So I took that literally. This second one uh, is called Cloud Plague. So I'm kind of obsessed with clouds but I don't have enough for a whole book. So they're just interspersed here and there in my collections. So this, this one's Cloud Plague and it's after a photograph by Doc Blanchard. Out by Dave's place, clouds touch the earth, swallow the cows and fields. Trees still bloom as always, covered with soap, soap bubble blossoms, bursting all at once from naked branches after rain. But when the petals fall, you can't see them for all that whiteness. Nobody dares step into the field to probe with a toe for the vanished ground. Scientists arrive from the university skirting the edges of the field, taking notes. They've built fences, but you can't really hold a cloud or keep it in place. They've just had to let the place go, hoping it will all reappear, the rocks and bushes, the patchy grass, 
with its resident gophers and squirrels, crabgrass, all those things we thought would outlast us. Right. <clears throat> so let's see. Uh, Pablo, are you ready to read? Oh, before you do, though, uh, yeah, yeah. before you do, I want to invite everyone who's uh, here, whether it be uh, on Zoom or on um, YouTube, we used to be able to pass a hat, but the only way to pass a hat in, uh, in virtual space that we can think of is to ask you to donate. Um, on um, Al's website um, for after hours and whatever we get, we will split between the two features. It's kind of a thing. Um, how much do we get paid for our poetry? Mm, very little. And uh, you can make tonight more meaningful to the poets if you uh, show your um, appreciation with a little. Al, did you want to say anything about how people can do that? Um, well, I just posted a link in <laughs> Zoom and I was, and as you were speaking, I was working on posting that link on the YouTube chat. So people can just see the chat on YouTube um, and give a little something to our featured readers. Let them know you love them. Yeah, so even though it says after hours, uh, we promise you the money gets to our features. So, all right, Pablo, let's hear from you. It's good to see you. To Nina, I'm happy you're in a sunny place. Um, so uh, this, these two poems um, come from um, Putin's war crimes. So um, that's why I'm sharing them today. So the first one is Syria for Omran Dagnish. This whole time you could have Google mapped Aleppo, panned to the Lebanon border, zoomed in on the home sugar factory across the bus stop from the M5 Damascus Aleppo highway, headed north to the Citadel facing the Faculty of Medicine University the corner from Cheche Cafe where students once played soccer in the park. In 2002, the Secretary of State John Bolton argued for Syria to be added to the axis of evil as a state in need of, inter of military intervention. By 2005, he was U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. By the time Omran Dakhnish was born, students had hit the streets and Bashar al-Assad declared swaths of his own people terrorists. Omran knew nothing of how one fills a barrel with shrapnel, oil, and explosives to drop out of an open door of a helicopter. Omran knew nothing of proxies and the importance of a port city to Russian ambitions across the Black Sea. Nothing of Annex Crimea. At five years old, he stares out at the world he does not know, a gash across his brow, concrete and flesh, rubble and ash, the slump of his narrow shoulders. A barrel bomb blooms its violence, first in metal, then in fire. In the back of an ambulance, Omran Dagnish puckers his lips, his face crimson and slate, on a Wednesday night, Omran Dakhnish, and across the world, the steel hoof of a pale horse, and hell follows with him. And this is my second poem. Um, it's called, O Lord of Clouds and Dew. How long will you hide your face? How long will you forget us? Either all seeing or all good, but not both. Damn the Lord of burning houses, of aerosol bombs. A mist of fuel covers the walls, the carpet in the lobby of an apartment building. In our own image, a cloud of fuel fills a room, like a piston in an engine, O oh Lord of death, a spritz of explosives and a ball of fire, fast as a gasp, 
a sudden vacuum, then collapse, screamed silence by concrete, along the world, a burst of heat out of the all good, but not both. Not both. Thank you, Pablo. You you cut out a little bit, so I hope you're still there. But uh, thank you. Um, next, I'd like to uh, call to the microphone, the virtual microphone. Leonard Lund. How you doing, Leonard? I'm doing good, Al. How are you doing? Okay. Another January night. To be honest with you, I have no clue if it was starry during the night. I was doing my best to end the day with the woman I'd given my heart to. 48 starry night years before, you insisted that all men are bastards, but wouldn't share the secret that you kept, preferring instead to say, you might love me. You spoke of finding an empty field tucked out of sight behind a thick windbreak, of wrapping yourself in snow and sleeping until spring released you once again. Sitting on a bench by the grade town square, I couldn't disabuse you of those thoughts. Still, by morning I felt you were, if badly wounded, safe, at least for the time being. Death is patient. Over the years and the miles and the changes, one and another of us talked you off the ledges. But in the end, we were outnumbered by that one demon, the one you ne never gave us more than glimpses of by night. Your favorites saw you off the stage beyond us. A bottle of the finest Irish, the pills to be chased down. I lean against the car while my wife gives me space to set a flame to memories, to fill the sky with stars. Vocabulary lesson. Hair, she pointed, touched my lips, her collarbone, again my lips. The clavicle from Latin, little key. The key too, she touched her sternum and said, make no bones. Take a photograph. You can take a photograph of your parents' anniversary or the dog that followed you. A woman you knew loved you absolutely, positively, forever who left without a last kiss. You can take a photograph and hang it in its silver frame or set it on an old oak dresser. Keep it in a drawer where no one else can look at it except your midnight tears. You can take a photograph then watch the sunsets fade it. The dusts of autumn cover it. And when it's gone its way, so no one else will remember, you will still see it everywhere. Thank you all. Thanks for that, Leonard. Um, so we've got one last person in the open mic. Um, Teresa, we're gonna have you start in just a moment, but I wanna remind you guys that we've got Cyrus and Virginia coming up in a minute. And um, Michael War, um, a guild, uh, the founder of the Guild Complex, uh, or co-founder, uh, is going to be with us next month with his um, with his creative, his current creative collaborator, who I will look up her name and uh, tell you when I've got another chance to. But in the meantime, uh, Teresa, so good to see you. 
Hi, lovely to see you, Nina. Thank you so much for asking me to read. Um, Alan, Bill, and Nina, thank you so much for organizing. Um, all the open mic readers and Cyrus and Virginia, it's so lovely to get to read with you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be reading some different stuff today. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited. I've been reading from my, my upcoming book mostly, but um, I just want to read something new. So, um, so this is a really old poem, but um, but this I don't. Anyway, it's an old poem I've been thinking about. Okay, um, useful for hearing this poem is probably um, the knowledge that both I am adopted and was in a really bad car accident once. Um, all right. Stranger, thank you for giving me this body to break on Lakeshore Drive. For the eyes I turn to the radio as the lady in the red SUV slams on her brakes. Thank you for bringing me into this world where my Pontiac crumples like cray paper, where the airbag's white fist pummels my chest and burnt talcum erupts like confetti, stains my clothes with the scent of singed hair. Thank you for my skin against bug blood stained glass as it shatters in the strobe of the headlights. For my legs that still stand stumble to the cracked yellow line of my lane as I mark its bandage of snow with my heels. I want to thank you for the college party that led to my conception. Cramped bedroom I can only imagine. How maybe your hands cold as comets curved against the bend of his back. How maybe your tongue moved in his mouth in this moment that leads to your body, weaving velvet layers of blood into my tongue, the cold bones of my hands, those small strands of DNA that swirl in your cells, replicating to muscle, becoming the thing that moves me, stranger, I lie in the ambulance when asked for my medical history. I watch the wiper break geode of city again and again, the snowflakes reform and I say, I know nothing about my birth mother. But what I mean is I've learned no name for how we've never sat across a table, fingers greasy with fries, how it wasn't you who read to me each night, taught me to make pizzas and Sunday gravy, rushed to the emergency room, but still somehow I know you by the beautiful facts of my fingers, my cracked sternum, the skin of my chest purpling with fireworks of blood. Thank you. All right, um, and then I'm going to read a new poem. Uh, sorry, I'm changing my mind um, about what I'm going to read. All right, um, this is called Shells, or Nursing After a Trip to Dollar General. He loves the bulk soap most. So many solutions for floors, cars, dishes, hands, every familiar surface of his small world. Their innards glow viscous and neon inside their plastic skins, transfigure the aisles, line them with lanterns. The small coins of his hands touch the bottles of dawn, tied gently as something alive. And I guess they once were, the fetal curl of a snail shell, the delicate flagella of algae, the luminescence of pelagic worms. The rigs need to drill deeper, drink further each year to find the sticky reserves of these old lives, turn them disposable, place them here on these shelves in our hands. I hate it here among the camp chairs leaching chemicals from their slats, the stacks and stacks of styrofoam, the flimsy toys I too have bought. I hate most of all the diapers I throw in my cart because the cloth ones leaked and soaked his sheets and besides whenever we drag our laundry down to the basement he cries in the carrier. But each time I almost say no, no dollar store today baby. I picture him duck-footed and wobbly, words still open, windows in his mouth, in the satisfaction of naming all the things he can clean. I hold him now, and he drinks deep from the well of me. 
how hard nursing was for so many months, the way he would chew with stony gums when the milk ran dry, and how always again I offered my breast, told him, take what he could. He looks up, says, mommy's nipple looks like a seashell. Some days how feral I feel, what terror not to know, what deep places I will wound for him. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. This is so beautiful. I'm so glad to be here. That was lovely. Yes, thank you so much. That was a wonderful open mic. Thank you, everyone. As as it so often is, we're on the on the second Monday of every month at Virtual Mollies. Um, do you think we should uh, take maybe a three minute break? Um, so YouTubers and anybody else who needs to can take a breather. What do you I think? think? I, I think that we will lose our momentum. <laughs> okay. I am happy to be uh, to defer. So uh, without further ado, I am going to um, introduce our uh, features and um, stay tuned also for the Q&A at the end, because that's just, that's really cool. <laughs> that's really cool. Okay. So we're starting uh, with Virginia Conchin, who is an author of four poetry collections. And as Cyrus was saying earlier, she has been uh, published in the New Yorker, which many of us envy you for. Uh, but the four poetry collections, Bel Canto on Carnegie Mellon, uh, Hallelujah Time, uh, any God Will Do, and The End of Spectacle, also on Carnegie Mellon. Um, she's also got a collection of short stories, Anatomical Gift, on Noctuary Press, four chapbooks, and a partridge in a pear tree. Let me see if there's... Um, she's also one of the... was one of the best new poets in I Don't See where she was here in Chicago for a few years. And now uh, she's, um, she's migrated up to Halifax, Canada, and that's where she is tonight. Let's hear it, Virginia. I'm, I'm just so glad I'm looking forward to hearing you. Thank you so much, Nina. I have nothing but wonderful fond memories of our shared times together in Chicago and attending several wonderful, I don't know how you would call them, literary readings slash community good gathering extravaganzas at your beautiful place. So, uh, and it's an honor to be, to read, to see you again and to, uh, to be here and also to be with Cyrus, a longtime mentor and friend and a writer that I admire deeply. So this is, this is a really wonderful opportunity for me just to share in your space. And um, I, uh, I hope that some of the poems I'll read tonight will interact in interesting ways with some of the themes that I heard come up during the wonderful open mic, conflictual relationships with religion and um, bodies broken, broken and singing, different forms of inheritance and maternity and also clouds, clouds, clouds. <laughs> and, and what clouds conceal being the sun. So. Uh, with that, I, I really appreciate everyone that read in the open mic and it's, yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'll read a few poems from Hallelujah Time, which is the book that came out in the, in the fall of 2021. Uh, title wasn't meant ironically, but some of the tone, some of the poems are a little bit on the acerbic side. I'll try to avoid those to keep it on the light side. <laughs> um, I'll start with the, the, the um, the opening poem, which is also the title poem of the collection for forthcoming with Carnegie Mellon. Bel Canto. Inside me is a black eyed animal struggling to get out, be free. Inside me is a failed attempt at explanation, a frozen pizza, a botched murder and a consumptive fallen woman heroine. 
It's not love until someone is willing to die for you or quotes you out of context. Agony, St. Joan or another valorous witch going up in flames. My transpersonal gender falls asleep and has a dream it is invulnerable. My metamorphic body falls asleep and has a dream it is inevitable. The slow slog towards slaughter in the form of a ruminating cow. Hand me my stilettos. Hand me my ativan, my floor length evening gown, my fainting couch, my spouse. Today is an envelope of money I will no doubt squander. Hand me my opera glasses. I want to shatter a champagne flute with my perfect contralto. I want to discomfort then bring down the house. So this this poem and, and several other poems in there it's just interested in like the idea of of vocal performance especially as it's expressed in a text um and yeah or a lyric speaker in, in an age when lyric speakers are uh kind of distrusted in a way <laughs> although it's you know uh performative <laughs> This one is for all the Judy, Judy, Judy Garland fans out there, and I'm sure you are numerous in number. I hope, at least. <laughs> a star is born. Don't mess with a woman from Texas. No, I'm not from Texas, but I was raised by wolves. In saying that though, am I appropriating this, the experience of those literally raised by wolves as I was only using it as a metaphor for neglect? Whatever. But really, you're going to do this root canal without Novocaine? I confess, I like witty people. I credit them with having overcome the shittiness of existence. What is my greatest dream? To become a jazz pianist and see money grow on trees. It's the getting there that hurts. It's the getting there that costs a gazillion dollars or its equivalent in virgin tears. When alone, we are all Judy Garland, and that is why I want to be alone. There is no way to describe the sublimity of music entering a room, suffering under a gag rule for years. If I can learn to do that, my God, I will have one. This one is about clouds, but it's long, so I'll, I'll skip it in the interest of expediency. <laughs> um, this one is a little homage to romanticism, to, to which we're all heir, however reluctantly. <laughs> romanticism. The heart does its own bidding, is more than just a pump. But it needs a storyline beyond failure, triple bypass, attack. The bathers, clad in seal skin caps, dive into ice cold water. And thus the heart is electrified, awoke. Without a pacemaker, half the world would be dead. Art wields a scalpel, science wields a knife. I place a wreath of antlers in your hair, declare us forest and wife. And a continuum on the continuum of. Uh, hmm. poems that engage with romance and rhetorics of economy. Um, this one is for my partner, who I think is in attendance, uh, Karash. <laughs> um, it's called Wheel of Fortune. This world contains many worlds. Why should the law of scarcity reign? Money is symbolic value, a broken palindrome. I make it, I spend it, and like a dumb squirrel, forget to bury it for winter. Memory equals intelligence for many species. Do you know where you hid that bone? I'm not you and you're not me. This is the origin of consciousness. Am I a citizen consumer or a child of God? Can you give me a day without pain? Yours, the face that tanks ships. Yours, the viable pregnancy. This post isn't performing well. 
The manufacturing sector has thought of almost everything except the value of an hour. Value me, but not before a thorough appraisal. Be the bodyguard who'd shield my body with your body. Carry me out of this club, draped over your back like a gunny sack, and I will gamble away my one life for you. And I'll just read two short more ones from this collection and uh, a couple of new poems. Um, anyone know of the restaurant Golden Corral? <laughs> if you've been once, you've been a thousand times, but it's a chain restaurant in the States. They might have franchises elsewhere. <laughs> Stuff. Anyway, this is based on kind of uh, that whole system of uh, restaurant management and corporatization of America. Golden Corral. A new epoch of war is upon us once again. We sit down and feast on a trembling fount of mashed potatoes, sides cascading with gravy. Watermelon, rice pudding, buttered noodles, corn. It's buffet style. Bodies hum as they deliver themselves to the altar of their past. These days, language is a mere expedient, a thing that hastens the arrival of a thing. We pay at the front. Outside the franchise is a wooden barrel teeming with flowers. The chrysanthemums open their opera throats. Prima Donna's waiting for the rain to come thundering, like the idea of devolution down. And then this, this uh, collection ends with like an abecedarian chapbook. Um, so I was going to just take a crowdsource, uh, a letter from A to Z that anyone would like to hear. <laughs> Cute, okay. <laughs> Q is for quintessence, quaaludes, division of a census population or discrete, discrete quanta into fifths for ease of sampling. Quixotic Quentin Tarantino's camera in the highly stylized Western, food to Django, a renegade. Q, quadrille danced by four couples in a square to queer opera melodies. Q, querulous quicksand, slow death of the status quo. Q, quarantine, self-sufficient O bisected by a blade. A quiver of arrows belonging to Cadmus Everdeen, cinematic queen of the Hunger Games. Questing, quintuplets, quandary, quince, deed of sale, sign with a quill, made from the flight feathers of a goose, swan, eagle, owl, crow, or hawk, and dipped in ink, tool of choice for scribes who who favor unmatched quality control to pen the Magna Carta or other treaties of questionable peace. Quitting is not an option. Quiet, this is a library. Quoi de neuf, qu'il se please. <laughs> it was an experiment just in what came to my mind when I thought of each particular letter of the alphabet. Thank you for listening and I'll just read it. I, Nina, is it time for, could I, is it two more or I could end there? No, it's um, G. <laughs> oh, what? G, or actually, why don't you- Oh, it was G? Oh, she said, you know, oh, I, Robbie, I, I changed my mind. My, oh, I apologize. No, you know, my new, um, last month, um, I got interrupted in the middle of uh, Molly's, uh, hearing that my niece was going to be born and was, they had gone into labor, they, um, and her name is Cecilia. So would you just see? Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, I, I, honestly, I could, we could end with just a few of these poems with anyone calling out letters of letters that are significant to them. I, this is, that makes me happy. So C is for churches, co-mingling, clandestine thieves. C is for circulation of carbon dioxide, gossip, memes. C is for cutthroat corporations assigned personhood, 
criminally seeking tax shelters, bailouts, and banks in Luxembourg and Andorra in which to, to deposit extorted cash. C is for circumspect lawyers with careful enunciation and smooth cryptic smiles, holding court before the prosecution, witnesses, stenographer and crowd watching from an orbiting aircraft or cruise missile submarine. C is for CNN, Fox News, rigged conglomerates, stating curiosity in 24 hour news cycles over sensationalist lies. The Commonwealth's catabolic rate races to the spine's root chakra. Then sphinx-like sphinx -like expels toxic contaminants in its ascension to the cerulean sky. Yeah, oh, she's definitely got more time, doesn't she? Um, I've just been enjoying the work. I haven't been watching the clock. Um, you can read a couple more if you like. I'll read two more short ones that are that are newer, and then and then I'm 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 really excited to hear Sarah's. Um, I will read. Uh, I, I'll read two new poems that are unpublished from a manuscript in progress, which is something that I don't normally do, but. Um, Actually, yeah, okay, let's do that. <laughs> one is called, the first one is called Yoga Veda. On the day of my coronation, I requested a little chaos, a little filth. I requested a day in which I'm not dying, but was denied. So now I just shut up. How long do I have to hold this pose? When the tiger dances, she has no partner. Why is the bestial always subsumed? Self-invention is a modernist concept, but what does that have to do with the apocal under theorization of the soul? Beautiful blur, you are allowed to know and not understand. You are allowed to protest against the dull accumulation of years. Consider a surf your mountain. Consider your proximity to the stage. Labor benefits world markets. Contemplation benefits the mind. Yet when I stood before the thinker by Rodin, I realized all is not vanity, but dross. Still, I straighten my spine at the board meeting. I nod emphatically and murmur at the doubling down of trustees. I loved you before you were lovable because you broke the world record for pole vaulting. Because you gave me, because all you gave me was all I needed. Not sun, not shade, not water or food, but air. And then I'll end with, um, I, I spent a lot of time alone, like many of us, especially during the pandemic. And my, my two cats have become um, a, my paramount companions and um, <laughs> interlocutors in a way. So this is a love poem for my uh, tabby cat, Gigi. Um, well, inspired by her at least, but hopefully it opens into other things, it's short. <laughs> and it's titled Epistemology. So much I can't know. My cat, is she staring at or through the window? Of what does she dream when she chatters nonsense to the birds? Are her songs a promise or a threat? And does she humor me or I her when I murmur sweet nothings into the upturned conch of her ear? A pale pink miniature roving satellite. My little gladiola, golden harp, reason for continuance hothouse orchard, if life would be so kind, I would serve you even better after dearth, pardon me, death. Je m'excuse, sickle cell anemia, Alzheimer's, measles, shingles, leprosy, gout. Ours was an overnight affair. Psalmist return, return to singing before whom nations kneel. It's only when time is spent that I value it. 
Baroque pearl. It's only then at world's end, on some enchanted evening beneath Empyrean skies, that I know I'll never die and that only love is real. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure glad we had this other opportunity to uh, to get you here. And I hope there will be more opportunities. Cyrus, I hope maybe I could invite the two of you to Chicago to just hang out at the same time. And I'm going to use this opportunity, by the way, to say something you've heard me say so many times before, which is that uh, besides needing your donations, uh, well, maybe not needing them, but we do want to show that poets are, are worth an awful lot. Actually, you know what? Um, there's been a little back and forth that comes from uh, that comment about uh, jazz, jazz pianists, wanting to be a jazz pianist so I can see money grow on trees. <laughs> Did I get that right? So, you know, I'm saying my my husband is is rolling uh, in the aisles with laughter. And somebody said, I'm sure it was meant that way. And then uh, Jim Madigan says, everybody knows the big money is in poetry, not jazz. So <laughs> <coughs> back to my point, which is in addition to donations, buy their books, you know, Reading both of these poets' uh, poems and hearing them uh, is a gift, but also buying their books is a gift to the poets as well. Um, so you're hearing little bits of different collections, and I really encourage you to uh, go out and buy their books. And now I am going to introduce Cyrus Cassells, who is really a wonderful teacher as well as poet. He's the 2021 Texas Poet Laureate. And among his uh, honors, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Lambda Literary Award, a Lannan Literary Award. Uh, his 2018 volume, The Ga Gospel of According to Wild Indigo was a finalist for the NAACP Image Award, uh, Still Life with Children, uh, selected poems of Francesca, is it? Uh, Francesca Parcerisas, yes. whatever. I've just butchered that. I have no doubt. Francesca Francesc Parcerisas. Uh, male, male, Francesca. Male, male. Yes. I saw an SC, and it, words aren't supposed to end with those in any language other than <laughs> uh, from Finland or Catalan. Yes, Catalan, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was awarded uh, the Texas Institute of Letters. I'm not going with your foreign, I'm sorry, Cyrus. Don't worry. I do it. Uh, best translated book of 2018 and 2019. His last volume is The World That the Shooter Left Us from Four Way and just, just came out last month. And I've been really looking forward uh, to this. Um, so sorry about butchering names. Uh, at least they weren't yours. Okay. Um, I'm so very pleased to be here. Uh, both Nina and Virginia are workshop students who are amazing, amazing poets. And we're it was a thrill to discover their work and to be, you know, a little bit of a midwife for mentor there over the years. Uh, as you can tell, the wit and wisdom of Virginia and her poetry is incredible and in imagistic splendor. Um, she's also one of the most brilliant critics in the country and minds. So I just think the world of her. So when I thought of who I wanted to read with and I saw that she was in the mix, I thought, yay, Virginia. Um, that was one of the best open mics I've attended, by the way. Um, I think many of you are Chicago poets. I'm so glad that you are, were a part of this evening. And I got a little taste of uh, the Chicago poetry scene. Uh, it was really inspiring and uh, I loved hearing the poems there. 
the serendipity of things. <laughs> I have been hiding from the world. I have a 25 page abecedarian dragon. I should call it, but I'm starting with a C, a sedarian ab dragon that I, I haven't really known what to do with because I've been so prolific um, in, with other projects. So I worked on it uh, in the desert. I was a guest of the Christ in the Desert Monastery. And I worked on this long, and it's just, it's unlike anything I've ever written. It's just a combination of words and sounds. So I think Virginia reading it is gonna give me courage to, I was thinking, well, maybe it could just be a chat book. I don't know where to put it there. So um, this new book is actually, uh, one of three books I created in the summer of 2019. And uh, I was very lucky that Four Way gave me a, a two book contract to do the one that's just come out, The World That the Shooter Left Us. And another book coming out in two years called Is There Room for Another Horse on Their Horse Ranch? And the three books are very different from each other. Uh, the, the monastery book came out two years ago and I may read one poem from that, but mostly I'm gonna read from the new book. What else to say? It seems super deliberate and super political, but it poured out of me in the space of eight weeks. It's the most mysterious creation of my life. I was overseas in Spain and Italy the summer before the pandemic and all my feelings about our country poured out of me. Super rapid. So to give people a sense of what happened, the epigraph for the book is, is by Adrienne Rich from her 1995 volume, dark fields of the Republic. And it best expresses my relationship to the book and how it got created. It's called, And Now. And now, as you read these poems, you whose eyes and hands I love, you whose mouth and eyes I love, you whose words and minds I love, don't think I was trying to state a case or construct a scenery. I tried to listen to the public voice of our time, tried to survey our public space as best I could, tried to remember and stay faithful to details, note precisely how the air moved and where the clock's hand stood and who was in charge of definitions and who stood by receiving them. When the name of compassion was changed to the name of guilt, when to feel with a human stranger was declared obsolete. <laughs> I'm still getting used to the physical object. Ready, aim, fire. Unfortunately, this poem is always relevant. Ready, aim, fire. In the ready, aim, fire of the new indignant open carry era, bloodstains in the salient leaves and branches of the tree of life. Karina emphasizes, in protein English, we have a plethora of words for lethal weapons. And of course, Columbine, Sandy Hook, and Parkland aren't the three names of coruscating stop the press's graces. Rabbi Lev confesses that he now must post a chilling sign proclaiming firearms aren't allowed in synagogue pews or anywhere near the Torah scrolls. Yes, in tabernacles and doleful churches, in wailing school parking lots, we cry. We can't go on living like this. And then we go on living like this. Deadfall, savage protocol, splattered all over our classrooms. This poem is about election day, 2016, and the, the havoc in my university town. It's just called election and it's all true. Actually, election. On the noisome morning of the tampered election, we found posters eclipsing university buildings, 
inglorious flyers soliciting arrest and torture, tar and feathering, meant to gag, quote, left-leaning campus leaders, flash timber. In ignoble fall, we woke to a flinty fist and bicep era, defiled headstones, daily alarums of mordant threats aimed at impassive elders, passers-by jostled on municipal streets. We woke to reptile cool comments of spit, unremitting slurs, and Muslim girls taunted and slapped on public buses. Non-compass mentis for a king, flim flam, an unbridled foundry of chicanery, a crafty corsairs, or a vehement robber baron's loot fast dynasty. Yes, we woke incredulous to dewy faced fifth graders lowering deliberately in a sun flecked field to fashion a human swastika. This is a poem in memory of Eric Garner. It's called, Is Not, Don't Interrupt the Sorrow. I was listening to an old Joni Mitchell tune uh, from the Hissing of Summer Lawns called, Don't Interrupt the Sorrow. Is Not, Don't Interrupt the Sorrow. A taser is not an answer. A rushing bullet is not a dream. There is no sunny God in an Apollo helmet. A live long mercenary is not a frisking meadow lamb. Lady Justice is no fearsome chimera, no lurking drone, no business as usual Cerberus. A callous Caesar is not a far seeing Christ. Listen, a blazing Mississippi cross never presages a Messiah, a daffodil in a quote sundown town never signals the onset of spring. So after two callous seasons, I finally dared to inquire if my friends taken too soon father's ousting stand your ground assassin was indeed white, lily white. And naturally his response in this volatile domestic, this gallery of averted eyes and Jim Crack defenders galore was yes, Dear God, of course, yes. Don't interrupt the sorrow, a woman croons, but all I catch is the ack, ack, ack of ink blotter redaction, the X-rated splutter of a black sight's waterboarded man, or a flailing cigarette seller, cuffed, gasping for air, jinxing arm and insignia, marring his throat. Is not, is not, is not, is not. And a poem in memory of George Floyd um, written in the summer of 2020. Most of the book was written in the summer of 2019, but I added the Floyd poem and a uh, pandemic poem. This one's called Dosage. And there's some scenes from the pandemic as well. Dosage. Since you ask, it's always a fire hosing summer in the unrelenting Dixie of the antebellum mind. Bell as in belligerent. Drawn, not quite rusted swords, cobweb oaths, and querulous cannon fire of the intractable Confederacy, smudged postcards from the plantation picnic come lynching, punishing stars and barricading stripes, arriving as a plebeian barrage of handcuffs, rubber bullets, and cop lobbed canisters of tear gas. Open wide, here's your daily dosage of breathlessness and black body counts, rakish chokeholds and blue surge knees to the neck, which only the dash cams upbraiding oracles bother to reveal. Speaking of can-do doses and cure-alls, folks, there's a dead sure virus on the list. So what's the perfect ratio between household cleaner and human blood? The right is rain or 
heaven sent manna dose of controversial hydroxychloroquine. Shorty, the never fail bootlegger insists, it's all about mixing the moonshine, the backwoods hooch just right, without killing the clients, secrets in the sauce, admits one repentant Dixie Bell after viewing the inglorious footage. I do declare when poor luckless Mr. Floyd cried out for his mama, it broke my barbecue and hush puppy heart. It broke the camel's back, oh my country tis of thee. I'll read one more poem in that sequence. Um, this one's called The Spirits of Slave Catchers Are Still Walking Among Us. Full frontal blast of the N word, sullying the windshield of your family car, or sprayed on your innocuous chapel door. See, the spirits of slave catchers are still hectoring, ensnaring, unerring bloodhounds on the track at the mall esplanade in the glittering bean-shaped pool at the mild as milk library story hour. Where is your pass? Brash, unfailing hunters trailing your workaday step, tireless collaborators, quick to call Becky's and Karen's, tattletale bells, all tattletale bells, all too avid to sip from whites only fountains once more. Wrestlers and forces insisting black bodies stay, get a mound, earthbound, cradle still and velvet lined elm or alderwood coffins. Sundown towns they're labeled because Lord, you can't be black after dark and expect to make it out alive. Say it with me, dull and cavalier as a Delta bound trains Jim Crow curtain. The spirits of restless slave catchers are still roaming among us, hungering, unceasing. The spirits of slave catchers are still. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a couple persona poems. Um, this is from a sequence. The second part of the book is about um, same sex uh, sexual harassment and abuse. Not something that gets talked about publicly a lot. Um, this one uh, is the, in the voice of the uh, son of a movie star. It's called The Mother Who Says Yes to the Sword. Oh, has been mother of the free flowing booze and handy diet pills. You cashed me in a cool sacrifice to jumpstart your floundering career. You let the bozo Lothario you got hitched to turn me into his very own Beverly Hills 9021 Pinocchio. While Miss Pampered as F actress was oh so busy elsewhere, sloshed, passed out on Tarantino set or tanning in some posh Emerald Coast location. When the subject turned to your eldest son's welfare, you flat out lied to the drooling media on your coke nose Geppetto's behalf. But my adorable Clearasil nose never grew an inch in the courtroom. Mama on the witness stand, you're like the cagey Shrike, gauging King Solomon's testing sword the low down biblical fake who in order to stake her maternal claim doesn't hesitate to agree to sever her young son's body. And I don't have a more serious Ukraine poem, but I do have a poem about the Ukraine from a previous chapter from four years ago. You'll recognize the speaker and the familiar phrase, it's called quid pro quo, two baritones on a phone. Guess there's been a little change in largesse, a little holdup, you might call it, with your country's battle-logged plea for additional funding. Frankly, there's zero need at all to include mealy mouth underlings, meddling congresspersons, aggrieved ambassadors are those cloak and dagger snitches, liberals out and out praise as whistleblowers. In heaven's or tiger mother Russia's name, 
it's just between us, artful and enterprising men, two barren tones on a phone, two stable geniuses. Hell, it's wartime, Z, and you're downright starved for superior firepower, for buff state-of-the-art supplies. The filthy lowdown is, I'd like you to slur, impugn, sling bedeviling mud at a certain polling high candidate and his linchpin paper pushing son. Let me be blunt. I'm the big daddy with the dazzling purse strings. And I've got you by one, the cowlick, two, the coattails, three, your slick ex-Soviet short hairs. Choose one of the above. Boy, I'm the badass overseer with the blade and I've got you hamstrung as a shackled fetch from swampland slave. But what do you eager garlic eaters, you hinterland guys know about cotton picking Dixie field hands anyhow. And so my cold cocked marionette, my Ukrainian cat's paw, you do plan to mount and raise your fancy victory flag, don't you? Hmm, I thought you'd say yes. And I'll just read a couple more. Or I think I'm just gonna read one more. This is my pandemic poem written in April of 2020. Um, I was in San Francisco, and we were the first people in the country to be sheltered in place before the rest of you. We didn't know what shelter in place meant, but it all happened on what St. Patrick's Day. I didn't think I had anything to say at that point, but apparently I did. So this is the addendum to the book. It's called The Only Way to Fight the Plague is Decency and American Elegy. The title comes from Dr. Ryu's quote in Albert Camus' The Plague. The only way to fight the plague is with decency. The only way to fight the plague. Once upon a time, there was a hoax, a broadcast till the hilt ruse. Roos, a puerile leader's adamant refusal to rally arms against a colossal viral dragon, a winter hustler's fiat that bloomed one titanic coffin heavy April into a real as your mama's dying hand pandemic. National Malay featuring stock selling senators, mission in action test kits, mask begging nurses, millionaire high fives, and jerry built morgues. A storm haired Lear's flaccid sideshow, a charlatan's heedless snake oil matinee. Hail the flim flaming functionary and his red handed band of rogues. Land where all the poisonous hierarchies arrive to poison us once more. Where raucous pettiness equaled roll calling brisk as business death equaled my crushed kingdom for a ventilator. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Come on, one more. Okay. I knew somehow I needed to end with the previous book. So this is this is the last poem in my, my sequence called More Than Watchmen at Daybreak. And uh, what else to say about it? Uh, the title is, a, is a, a phrase from one of the Psalms. And it has its political dimension, but it's, um, I'll just read it. More than watchmen at daybreak. The river's soft pistons, the river's black silk, undershooting stars, the voluble ink and silver white sky looming above the stark monastery becomes the coppice elk's vast eternity, the duena moon all at once coquettish, Rashes sin, blanches the river curve, the heron, the corral of fast asleep horses. August, the soul says, yes, I was there when raffish runaway flames claimed the orphanage, when rampant smoke drove the dying into the summer sea present when riled protesters cried, they fire into the crowd. 
and then they fired into the crowd. When the aghast stranger fingering a galling dungeon photo asked, what kind of God would allow that? More than fleet querying owls, more than night long watchmen, born wide awake and dying, I confess, not even in this wondrous colossus of shooting stars, the extravagant earth's countless beauties seem capable of quenching this lust, this innermost hunger for return. Incensed and restive in this desert monastery, thirsty, fallible, but not yet resigned, full of questions and parrying, Lord Buddha, God of Abraham, from Wolf's Hour to Blue Hour to Burgeoning Dawn. Thank you. Wow. Thank you both, Cyrus and Virginia. Both. Wonderful. Yeah. Both so wonderful. Um, can you hear the dogs back here? We don't the, the chicks and the and the roosters are asleep, but we've got that we've got the dogs out. She's referring to the chicks and roosters in my yard in Hawaii. So it's like <laughs> we're battling the animals are battling here. <laughs> yes, thank you. That's Rocco. Rocco. You, you may hear Petunia. <laughs> oh, that's right. I love Petunia as a dog name. I love it too. So um, I want to start the Q&A um, with, well, I want to start by asking you not your influences, but what, um, what has driven your latest book? And this is a question for both of you, because I mean, at a certain level, um, Cyrus, it's kind of obvious what what you were encompassing, but the drive part is a little bit different. You know, I'm asking you to, yeah. Okay. Um, as I said earlier, it's the most mysterious thing I've ever written. I wrote it so fast in the middle of the other books. And the other books have completely different sort of temperaments and ideas. So I think um, there was there was like a precipitating event that was quite extreme uh, there in Europe in the summer, and I think just a lot of energy and emotion poured out of me, and I didn't know that I had articulated it yet. I, I'm not a person to in a hurry to write um, occasional poems or so. To be honest with you, because it was written three years ago when it was published last month on the 15th, I actually woke up that day and thought, oh my God, I don't even know what this book is really. <laughs> you know, it, it's like a white whale on the doorstep. I'm like, oh my God, this is like a really big thing that I did, but I don't know exactly why, how I did it. Seriously, I just, I thought, how could I have written 40 poems in a new book? One book was written in eight or nine months. And the other, the monastery book was over the course of a couple of years. So I'd never written so quickly. Um, I know that's not especially helpful, but I do think I, no, I think if you live long enough and, um, you know, it's just trying to make sense of the world. Now we grew up, we, um, <laughs> Generation Jones or Boomers, we grew up in a very different world of, of incredible idealism and optimism. So nothing in our upbringing, our childhoods, or our young adulthoods prepared us for this period in American history. And the fact that we are, we're not all complete basket cases is Speak amazing. Speak for yourself, it's a, Cyrus. Well, <laughs> it's an amazing <laughs> testament to our resilience because none of the values that we were raised on are present are currently present for the most part in the political atmosphere. There, there are a few people still holding the torch. So. I guess for me, <laughs> I wasn't in France, but Sufi was kind of it like, okay, the cloud of all of that, I'm away from America for three months straight. 
And in two of those months, these emotions and feelings about what was going on. And of course, as an African-American, I could not address police brutality and, and that, that aspect alone, but there's a lot of other things. And I didn't expect the parts of it to be like politically satirical, like the, like the quid pro quo poem, but there's something about the poet I, AI used to be a colleague of mine and there's something very powerful about the work, the persona work that she did. So I like to feel like her spirit was floating around saying, okay, go ahead, Cyrus, you know, let it roll. Let some of these crazy, crazier voices come out of you. And uh, that was surprising too. But again, I wrote them so quickly. I sometimes wrote one or two or three poems a day. Thank God it wasn't a Sylvia Plath blaze where I thought, am I going to die because I'm writing so much poetry? No, I didn't. So, so I've had to go back three years ago and sort of feel it out there. But those of us who love language, sometimes we wait for the opportunity to feel like we're ready to say something. And I guess I was more than ready. I'd held my tongue for a few years. Um, the title poem of my book is about the stand your ground killing of my assistant's and close friend's father. And that's really what, and the bigger picture precipitated the book was the injustice of that situation until the person who killed his father was actually convicted. His uh, defense was a lie and proven through for forensic evidence that, that it was a lie. Um, but because there were no surveillance cameras when my friend's father was killed, it was this whole sort of hearsay thing. And, you know, the man was held one night and then let go. And so and a, a killer person was wandering the streets just because of some, you know, the defense, which is, you know, you can claim, claim self-defense and you, they let you go. In this case, he was lying and they proved that he was lying. Or, so that was a, an event that, I didn't talk about it to anyone else out of respect for the family for a year until it happened to another family. And people are familiar with the Florida situation because it was caught on tape. And by the way, that man was also convicted of murder. Um, I didn't think I had something to say. And then the poem, the title poem started coming. It's like, and I had to think, Nina, do I really need to say this in public? And the answer was yes. The answer was yes. So. That's maybe <laughs> closer to what you were looking for. Like, yes, that was it. And that, and Ross Gay picked that poem for Poem a Day. And of course, when the poem was published, it was a week of the synagogue massacre. And was it Philadelphia or Pittsburgh? I can't remember somewhere. So like I said, unfortunately, these poems are about gun violence in particular are, are continually relevant in terms of our culture and some other cultures too there. So. Out of love, I created a kind of protest. And all I could do at the time since I was overseas was talk to the people at the Houston Chronicle, say, there's this incredible Latino family. The father was shot by an older white man because he didn't have a, a handicapped parking sticker in his car at night at the post office. So they did a story about it. And then, you know, the, the, the civil case started up again just end of January. So it's been this ongoing nightmare for my friend's family. And of course, the man is still unrepentant. You know, it's just, these are the dynamics and I tried to capture that. Again, I tried to capture the climate of what we've been living through as, as Adrienne put it so beautifully in her poem. You know, it's interesting because my sense of your work is that it is written out of love, from a place of love. Um, and so. yet this was, there was a lot of acerbic in there. Well, it's a book of shadows. That's my first book of shadows. I've, you know, I've dealt with war situations, but this is like really more of the shadows and really going into, you know, there's a lot, there's stuff about sex trafficking in the book and child attention and the really ugly part of our culture from the past few years that we're gonna to have to be looking at and then considering for the rest of our lives, I think that these were these were going on well, quote, supposedly on our watch. It's a difficult thing, but we're not gonna get over it anytime soon, just as Germany isn't gonna get over what happened there anytime soon, right? 
it's really that bad. So, and I think going out of the country and out of the rationalizations in the summer of 2000, it's like, okay, I can see this a little bit more clearly instead of the cloud of static and whatever that goes on that makes things perpetuate. And I will say this, and it is a political statement, I think, once you've experienced um, lethal gun violence in your family or near you, you're never the same person again. It's like you're on another shore. That's another raison d'etre of the book. It's like, okay, I'm on another shore now. I can't surrender to this apathy about it. And I don't know if you saw the movie Mass recently. It's a, it's a, um, a movie written for the screen. It's two couples, one, their son was killed in a shooter incident and the other couple, their, their son was the shooter. It's absolutely incredible. It's one of the best acted movies like ever. And Ann Dowd, who was on Handmaid's Tale, was getting nominations at BAFTA or whatever. The greatest performance of her career, greatest performance of Jason Isaac's career. It really gets into the nitty gritty of the situations on both sides and the pain and suffering. It's not sparing. I felt wrecked by the movie, but I needed it because I understand more of it now. So there's that element of it. But like I said, people, I'm just coming to grips with this book. I tell my graduate students over, over and over, your poetry making self is, for mine is usually two or, two or three years ahead of my everyday self. So maybe by the time the book is published, I'll understand the impetus for the poems and crea creation and language. But the poetry making self is wiser than the everyday blah, blah, person, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, you know. Virginia, you're nodding your head. Do you have a, uh, well, tell us about what was uh, the impetus in your most recent collection. You need to turn on your. Yeah, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Okay, I, I resonated with so many things that Cyrus said, and uh, especially about um, and in and, and your 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 comment, uh, Nina, in relation to Cyrus's comments about uh, wanting to have a through line of you know lyric proclamation or exclamation or song, and and yet being you know as a lyric subject kind of beset and subject to you know the the routine you know indignities and violence and um, you know, downright murders that are happening in our culture and society and systemic injustices left, right, and center. So uh, I, I, I think the impetus for this book, it, it, it wasn't even really, I mean, it's kind of a collated collection that was um, very beautifully put together by a Canadian publisher, which was excerpted from several books previously published. So it has poems from Any God Will Do. It has a couple poems from The End of Spectacle, it excerpts a, a revised version of Vox Populi, my first chapbook. So it's more of a kind of a compilation. So I can't really say that the book itself has like a through line that's that's that relates to my authorial intent more than uh, the editorial vision of the vehicle uh, editor. But I think um, it's this idea of you know you know history repeating itself, and you know if if we are going to continue to you know, repeat or enact through intergenerational trauma or not having learned our lessons as, as people and individuals and as cultures and as civilizations and as genealogies and as ancestries, you know, the same kind of violence and misunderstanding and misappropriation of, of each other that, that perpetuates the culture that we've been living in. I think this book just is, it's just, you know, speaking to a kind of interiority that uh, peace beginning within or voices and uh, subjectivities beginning on a more uh, quiet molecular subjective level. Um, well, you know, I, what I was thinking, Virginia, is that even if there isn't a through line you know, as you've matured as a writer, I do think either the themes that drive you or um, 
maybe some stylistic things or something that's rattling around in your head uh, may be kind of consistent across the poems that you write at a certain stage. And uh, I don't know if you can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think just to tie back one last time to Cyrus's comments, I think a lot of the poems, even if they're dealing with subjects of um, um, like consciousness or like modern love, for example, um, they're couched often in in a, in a rhetoric or in a, a discourse or in an environment of um, political or militarized violence. Like Les Années de Guerre is a poem based on a, a book of Quebecois poetry by my friend Samuel Mercier. Um, and it just means the war years. And it's, uh, it traces its lyric, lyric text based on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, I, and I, it seemed to me like an appropriate setting for a lyric poem about um, the weaponization of, of intimacy and in, in, in modern life. Um, so a lot of the poems I think um, have to deal with this, this idea of you know, you know, the personal and the political are always ever, ever and always colliding. And we can't really separate the weaponization of the quote unquote military industrial complex writ large from, you know, the, the toxicity that we often experience or encounter in our intimate relationships. So um, I, I think the, I think to speak more to your point, I think, you know, there's the, the, the through line is a sense a sensitization to these, 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 forces of you know powers from without and violence and and um an attempt to find a language that's you know that that, that insists upon a tenderness and a vulnerability within itself uh it, despite um you know despite the arrows that fly by day and by night and all around us <laughs> well here's what i'd like to do is to, in the time we have left, to invite each of you, uh, Virginia and Cyrus, to ask each other a question. Mm. Oh. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Give me a second. I have a question. Yeah, I'll, I'll go after you. Yeah. I'm I haven't a, had a chance to read your fiction and I finished my first novel that I worked on for a gazillion years, but I'm about 200 pages into a new novel. So I wanna hear a little bit about your fiction writing and you're switching from one mode to another or whether you don't really switch or how, how do you manage your, your fiction, your prose writing? Um, I haven't really written a story uh, per se for a couple of years. Uh, the, the fiction book came out in 2017. Um, but I think in, I, I'm teaching fiction right now in a, in a university in Halifax. So I'm engaged in the discourse of fiction, but it, although not writing it myself, but thinking, I think, I think that the connection that I make between poetry and fiction and what engages me right now is uh, the idea of self or selfhood or persona or persona um, and identity in our culture of, you know, fluid identities and identity politics being shaped and constructed by a narrative um, and by fluid, you know, ideas of, of narrative. So my, my fiction collection, I think, uh, engages with multiple uh, gender subjectivities, uh, uh, people from different, you know, ranks and classes and, and, and but all connected by, uh, you know, by an impassioned kind of quest for their inner truth, whatever that may be for that character. So um, this, is, I, this is inspiring. <laughs> my, first, my first novel has 10 different narrators <laughs> and it covers 120 years. Oh gosh. <laughs> and it's not chronological. So <laughs> I don't quite know what to do with it. I'm not sure whether it's stories or what it is. And um, I love it when I hear your description, or I talked to Jennifer Egan about, you know, her, her Goon Squad book that won the Polar Solo. She had no idea what it was, and she was writing. It. It's like, oh yeah, that's the way. I mean, I love to feel like I'm exploring, and I think the big difference for me, at least with my first novels, is it's super voice oriented compared to my poetry. 
I mean, you, yeah. I mean, I shared like some personas, but I thought, wow, that's what I like about it. You know, like, right. oh, yeah, this is interesting to me, even like, I think, I think the characters are great. The voices are great. So this idea of multiple perspectives and, and just including as much as you can in the narrative is uh, makes me want to read your fiction now. <laughs> well, and, and the fact the fact that you can interweave that I mean I don't I don't you know dry eye for the writer dry eye for the reader right I mean I I don't think any like I, the reason why I'm drawn to lyrical fiction as well as lyrical poetry is because there is an idiosyncrasy or an individuality often to uh, the vocal expression that seems so so much of a a stamp of that individuality of the author. Mm -hmm. um, that, that can't be kind of, you know, transcribed in another form that's, you know, as much as I admire like formalist poetry, for example, but especially as it relates to prose, like call me Ishmael. Like there's so many great opening lines to novels where, you know, you're captivated by, you know, <laughs> the idiosyncrasy of, of the narrator or by the protagonist. And, um, and I, I think there's, yeah, there's a beautiful synchrony there between the, the kind of insistence of a narrative voice where it's uh, J.D. Salinger. I mean, you could list so many examples where it's, yeah. uh, you know, where, where, you, where, you, where you get hooked and, the, and you're up till 4 a.m. and, you know, your roommate or your spouse or your, you know, your companion animal is like, come to bed. And you're like, no, I have to know how this ends. <laughs> and I think that's what I go to poetry and fiction for is that sense of captivation of, and, and, and for me, it's often by a compelling character or, you know, or voice. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of you were saying, and yeah. And I, um, my question for you would be, how do you deal with these, these very, very, ha you have a joie de vie that is just insuppressible, knowing you personally, as well as um, being familiar with your work, and, and yet you tackle and deal with everything from gun violence to the Holocaust. And I'm, I'm wondering how you sit with and deal with both narrative narratively and lyrically these very heavy subjects and yet you know allow your own voice to come through and allow the percolation of uh things like you know hope and how, how does that aerate your your work while dealing with these very very heavy historical subjects um well <laughs> i feel like I get assignments <laughs> and I'm drag kicking and screaming into them, especially the Crosshead Swastika book. There is no resistance with the new book, but the Crosshead Swastika book was, my mother died and I didn't think I should have to write about concentration camps while I was in mourning and yet there was an urgency. And maybe part of the urgency was I needed the work to help me to deal with my grief. Does that make sense now when I look back and I think, well, it's like, yes, you need to keep busy <laughs> and in a way that isn't distraction, but it's con connected to something powerful. So that's the phenomenon behind that particular book. I mean, it was one of those situations where I kept being directed to Anne Frank's house in Auschwitz and you're in Krakow, by the way, why don't you go to Auschwitz? <laughs> it was that kind of coincidence incident over and over and I thought well I guess this is a path that I'm on and and somehow I'm a repositor of that experience somehow so I think the most difficult poems I've just been hell no like what am I doing I was at Y2K in Paris and I started writing about I saw a Van Gogh painting of that wheat field um the crows and and all of a sudden his suicide kind of rolled into me. And I thought there's something so significant about that field. And I said, no, no, I can't start writing a Van Gogh suicide poem in the middle of the you know, New Year's Eve or whatever. So one gets one's assignment and the, the everyday self or Cyrus can kick and scream and whatever. But the work is the work and then the intellect hopefully shapes it in one's reading, shapes it in one's research shapes it and you just have to follow what's coming through your consciousness and you can reject it but 
I think the more one develops as a writer, you just like, okay, this is coming through. I do not know why. And then, like I said, later on, often you, you can figure it out a little bit more. You understand that your consciousness is leading you in a particular direction or revealing some very important aspect. For me with the Van Gogh poem, it was about mental health issues within my own family that I hadn't fully grasped until I looked at the Van Gogh brothers story. I thought, oh, I know which, which role I was playing, but I had to literally go to the town where, you know, over where he took his life and all that to figure, oh, it's really about your family too. You know, we talk about the political, the personal. Mm. It I sounds what, like a uh, Mission Impossible sort of thing. You know, your task should you choose to accept exactly. it, your mission. The, exactly. It's really been like that. And then other times it's like a joy. You know, the other book is like my sexiest, funniest book of love poems for over 60 people. It's like we're still alive. We're still having sex. Whatever. So I can't wait till that one comes out. We made a decision to, you know, to keep them two years apart, which I think was a good one. Mm. But I think writing the other book, which is sort of a sequel to Beautiful Senor, and I know that's Virginia's favorite of my books, allowed me to do the Book of Shadows at the same time I was writing these fun poems. And because I'm older, you know, I don't really care what people think about my romantic escapades or sexcapades or whatever they can call it. Um, in fact, originally the monastery sequence was in the horse ranch book. And I thought, well, I'd like to give it the sequence as a gift to the to the uh, Benedictine monks. I think I better pull the rest of those super homoerotic poems <laughs> and just sort of offer if they want to come over to the other book. So actually, I realized at first I thought it was a chat book, but now it's just, I feel like it's his own book. So you kind of have to keep being open about what's the what's the viable form for what you're doing. Yeah. You know, over over and over and over, right? So. I think one has to have relief and healing along with it and take care of oneself when you know your subject matter is so challenging. There's a lot of heavy uh, um, subject matter to be covered. Uh, yes. <laughs> coming up. Unending. You know, it's 8, 8.59. So we're really just wrapping up uh, just in time for all of you in the audience please consider buying their wonderful books and maybe even donating for the, for the readers. Next uh, month, we will have Michael War and Chun Yu from, I don't know if she's actually in uh, China, but I'm hearing that I, he made some comment about China. So um, her being in China. So we right. shall see. I love these Q and A's and I loved your poetry and I love the you. open mic and it was great. You want to add Al? I don't think there's anything to add. I just really enjoyed the conversation mm -hmm. uh, you. between you guys and uh, the readings. The readings were wonderful, very powerful. Can so, I say I gave a reading with Michael War in um, September of 2020. So I highly recommend their yeah. next reading with Michael and give Please attend. You be there too. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So good night, all us. We'll Virginia, thank you. Thank Bye you so much, see. Cyrus. Thank it was an honor to be with you, Nina and Al. Thanks, everybody. Bill, thank you for your beautiful curation and everyone that was in attendance. Yeah, this is a special evening. Thank you. <laughs>